Good afternoon, everyone. Very happy to see you again in the Quantitative History webinar. Uh, today, we are very honored to have Professor Stephen Moore from University of Constance as our speaker. Uh, Professor Moore uh, is working on a wide range of exciting topics in the field of economic history, economic geography, political economy, and long-run long development. And his, his research also spans uh, for, a, for a long time horizon uh, from the Iron Age, several centuries BC uh, to, the, to the modern era. So today, Professor Moore will introduce uh, to us his new research about the uh, economic legacy of the opening of uh, <clears throat> the canal of Panama. So uh, Professor Moore will show us how the opening of pa Panama Canal changed United States market uh, access and uh, economic geography and uh, gravity. So now let's welcome Professor Moore. Great. Thank you very much uh, for the remarks and thank you very much um, for inviting me. It's an absolute honor to present at this very nice and very interesting seminar series. Let me see whether the screen share hopefully works. So you should now hopefully be able to see my screen. Um, yeah, as uh, Jijeng already said, the project is called Economic Geography Aspects of the Panama Canal. It's a joint project with my co-author Ferdinand Rauch from the University of Oxford. And I'm very happy to be able to share this with you today. The basic idea here is that, you know, the, the effect of trade on how we agglomerate across space is a, is a very old and obviously very important question. You know, there's a very large literature on the effects of various infrastructure measures, be it railroads, highways, or ports. You know, it's something that's obviously of, of great importance to policymakers because, you know, of course, when we, when we build um, a new infrastructure project, um, we usually want to know how will this aff affect people, how will this affect the movement of people, how many more potential clients can we reach, how many potential employees uh, can we reach, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. At the same time, of course, you know, because these things are so relevant for policy, that also makes them um, quite hard to empirically estimate because, you know, usually they're, they're not placed exogenously, right? Typically, they are political decisions, they are uh, economic considerations. Um, so very often, you know, we, we, what we do is kind of case studies, and even then it's sometimes very hard to actually quantify, for example, what's the actual change in, in market access. And what we, what we do here is we use the opening of the Panama Canal to actually quantify the market access change due to this and to then estimate market access elasticities for US counties. So our contribution is fairly, firstly, we provide new measures of historic market access level for access market access levels for US counties around the year 1900, 1890, 1900 both domestic market access, so kind of the market access within the United States, but also the international, the international one to um, the markets outside of the United States. We then show that there's a fairly strong and, as we argue, a positive causal effect of market access change on population growth. Um, in particular, if, if we have a 1% increase in market access uh, for a county, in 1940, when the canal opens, then we have a population that's around 4.5% larger in 1940, which if you look at the map of the United States nowadays, you will see that you know, the population is very highly clustered along the coast. So this can help to explain a bit why this is the case. Of course, you know, we don't claim that this is the only explanation. The effect seems to be similar for tradable and non-tradable industries um, with, you know, Similar in the sense, overall, it seems quite similar, though manufacturing seems to react faster initially, services catch up a bit slower. Whereas agriculture doesn't seem to be affected much at all. And as we find positive values for uh, population growth, we also find positive values for wage growth, land values, and, and immigration. So, you know, what kind of, what's the literature that, that, that we think about? You know, first of all, I think, there's a very large 
literature on, on market access, international trade and growth. Um, here, you know, papers very often focus on the, on the country level. And then the question is, you know, if a country opens to growth, if there's some change in trading patterns, um, what happens to, to uh, sorry, if a, if a country opens to trade, if there's changes in trading patterns, what happens to the country's growth? You know, Franklin Romer is a, a very classic reference, um, but there are also others. For example, more recently, there's uh, Luigi Pascali's paper on the introduction of the steamship and how that changed the sailing patterns. And hence, you know, some countries benefited more than others. Um, these papers usually focus, as I said, on, on the country level. So, you know, if a country then trades more, what are the growth effects? Then there's also a, a, a literature on, on market access and the economic geography within countries. A very seminal paper here is, is uh, Reading and Sturm's 2008 paper where they look at the, the division and reunification of Germany and then look at cities you know, close to the border that lose kind of the trading opportunities um, to towns, villages close by that are now in a different country. Um, or, you know, Donaldson and Hornbeck have recently published this very nice quantitative analysis of, of the railroads and what they added to market access and how that affected uh, land values in, in the US. Now, if you, if you kind of look at these paper, I would say they kind of fall in, in, in two, um, two strands. You know, either they have full structural models like Donaldson and Hornbeck that use kind of a structural model to derive market access or they're very reduced form. For example, the Reading and Storm paper, um, they basically have, you know, it, it's just a reduced form of whether you are close to the border between West and East Germany. So there's actually no quantifying the change in market access. It's kind of obvious that if you're close to the border, you lose market access compared to a town further away from the border, but they don't quantify um, the market access change. So, you know, in some sense, what we had, aiming to do in this paper is a bit at the intersection of these two types of papers in that we, we don't have a full structural model. I think our exercise is more reduced form, but we're trying to quantify the actual change in market access. A third literature that we're speaking to um, is the one on social savings of the Panama Canal. Um, there's, uh, you know, it's very, it's always, very nice when there's already a paper in, in, the, in 1915, in the fifth issue of AER ever, um, that, that talked about this. Um, that was a very hot topic, of course, back then, if you think that the Panama Canal was opened in 1914, and the first paper in the AER was in 1915. So um, that was obviously, obviously something that uh, was very interesting back then. And there have been other papers uh, since then doing similar exercises. And then finally, there's also a related analysis that also looks at reconfiguration of, in this case, cities in the case of Canada. Let me, you know, before going into what we're doing, let me give you a brief history of, of the Panama Canal. I think the night, you know, the Panama Canal is, is, you know, in some sense, a bit of an obvious idea, right? If, if you look at the map, um, this seems to be like a very natural way, natural place of, of, of uh, doing a canal. And so already in, in the 16th century, a priest had a, Spanish priest had a rather pragmatic approach. He said, well, yes, there are mountains there, um, but there are also hands. And if you're the king of Castile, few things are impossible for you. So you know, he advocated that Spain should build that canal already back then. Um, nothing came of that, though, and, you know, also in, in other years, Alexander von Humboldt uh, was a proponent of the canal. He wanted to have it built in Nicaragua. Um, he visited President Jefferson at the White House for two weeks, and it's believed that he also made the case um, at this point um, that uh, the canal should be built. And uh, Ulysses S. Grant in 1881, when, uh, when he was president, also said that, you know, the canal would be a great idea for the Europeans, but for, for us Americans, he said that the benefits would be incalculable. And then the one that actually did it was Theodore Roosevelt. Already in his first message to Congress, he kind of urged um, that the canal should be built. And he would also then be the one that actually would uh, see it to the end. 
there was already a connection across the ism of Panama um, before the, um, the, the, the canal, that was the Panama Railroad, which was um, completed in, in, 80, in 1855. It was very parallel to the, the current uh, route of the canal. And in some sense, actually, the, the railroad predetermined a bit where exactly the, the canal was built, because obviously that made it easier to transport equipment or workers, for example. Um, it was 76 kilometers long, and until the opening of the canal, it was a very popular railroad, sometime one of the most profitable railroads in the world, the most highly priced stock at the New York Stock Exchange. But at the same time, you know, it was, it, it transported goods, but that was not its focus. The, the, it was really more used to transport, to transport people or, you know, very high priced goods, for example, the gold from California. Why was that? Because, you know, of course, it was a very expensive, uh, expensive route. Um, so the costs were so high that they ate away a lot of the reduction in distance. And hence, for a lot of goods, it was still easier to just take the, the long sea route uh, all around South America. The first, let's say, practical idea then of, of building the Panama Canal um, were, came uh, from Ferdinand de Lesseps. Uh, French engineer, and you would think, you know, if anyone could do it, he would be the one. Uh, he had been the developer of the Suez Canal, so he clearly knew a thing or two about, about canals. He started in 1882 with a private company that was funded by the French public, run by French engineers, um, trying to source material subcontractors locally and from the US but things actually didn't go very well. A lot of workers died from the local illnesses, mostly yellow fever and malaria. And actually the company ran out of money in 1889 and then declared bankruptcy. This is when, when, when Theodore Roosevelt comes into play. As you remember already in, in his, when basically the moment he became president, he advocated building the canal. And in 1904, the US purchased the rest of the French canal company and they continued the work. Another kind of legacy of the canal is the, the, the country of Panama. Um, this used to be part of Colombia, but the US actively supported the revolution that led to the independence, the secession of Panama, and thus created the, the modern country of Panama. The canal was completed in 1914, opened in August of that year. Um, if you look at the timing, you know, in some sense, it couldn't have been worse because it opened just about, about the same time that World War I started. And there were only some of the initial problems that the canal had. There were some landslides, there were strikes. In spite of that, actually, there were 1,000 crossings in 1915 and over 2,000 in 1918 and then already nearly 3,000 in 1921. So while there were some initial problems, you can see that trade or passages through the canal actually um, went quite fast and picked up relatively soon. Um, nowadays, obviously, you know, the, these numbers, 3,000 per year pale compared to nowadays, we have 40 ships going through the canal every day. Um, most of it has either origin or destination in the US, followed by China, Mexico, Chile. Um, Europe nowadays is actually quite down uh, the list. That was something that's obviously very different back then um, and when the canal was opened. Uh, one thing that actually I, I learned um, while working on this project is, you know, I always thought if, if you look at, at, at the map of, of, of Panama, I always thought that the canal would go from the Atlantic to the Pacific in a kind of east-west uh, dimension, but actually it goes kind of from the northwest to the southeast, as you can, as you can see here. So, um, you know, if, even if you don't believe any of my results, hopefully you know, that's maybe something that um, you can take away from this seminar today. Now, you know, what does the historical narrative tell us a bit of, you know, when should we expect what to happen? Obviously, you know, we can't rule out an effect due to the railway already from 1850 onwards, but, you know, again, given that it was mostly used to transport people, uh, we think that this effect should be relatively small. Then, you know, there could be an effect during construction, right? Because, you know, if you think of the United States, that was probably the typical place where capital 
was sourced, where maybe workers were sourced. So already back then, counties close to the canal uh, might have benefited. But still, the big shock should come after the opening in 1914, and maybe particularly after the end of World War I. And then, you know, we would probably expect that it should be a, a continued effect as international destinations grow. You know, first Europe, especially after World War II, then Asia, and then global trade increases. Though, for the purpose of today, um, I will focus mostly on the time until 1940. Um, as you will see later, you know, most, most of our analysis focuses kind of on changes in 1900. So kind of the further away you go from this, um, the more imprecise this measure gets. So that's why at the moment we kind of cut off at, at 1940. Okay, so now let me tell you what we actually do. Uh, we use uh, a variety of different data sources. Um, one of the most important one is a US county panel that is based on um, the paper by Guy Michaels and co-authors in 2012. This gives us matched counties. So matched in the sense, you know, US counties from time to time get redistricted or they merge or they get split up. And this is a data set that kind of has a unified county observation over 120 years, always at 20 year intervals. And it contains data on, on total population and employment um, by the three industries, agriculture, services, and manufacturing. Then to this, we add um, US domestic transportation cost matrix that comes from the recent paper by Donaldson and Hornback, which basically gives us county to county travel costs, taking into account the different modes of transportation that existed in 1890, right? So if I wanna go from New York to St. Louis, you know, maybe I need to go by railroad a couple of uh, hundred kilometers and then maybe a canal or maybe I go by road. Um, depending on, you know, this matrix basically takes into account all this with different cost parameters and then gives you a, a dollar cost of how much would it cost to transport um, one ton um, over uh, from, you know, place X to place Y. Then we have a global ports data set in 1900. This comes from a, a list compiled by Luigi Pascali for his Wind of Change paper, which tells us for you know, most countries in 1900, what is their usually one most important port or sometimes two or three most important ports, um, what's an estimate of their GDP per capita and what is their population. And then what we add is we, have also a list of US ports. And for each US port, um, we calculate the distance going over water to every port in this Luigi Pascali list. Okay, so we calculate the distance from New York to Shanghai going over water. And we do this twice, once in a world where there's no Panama Canal, right? Which means from New York to Shanghai, it's actually quite complicated. Um, and once, where the, uh, the Panama Canal is open. So from New York, you would go through the canal and then across the Pacific. And then based on this, um, we basically um, create a measure of market access change for around 1890. So we kind of fix things um, at this level. So we don't take into account changes to the transportation network that will take on, that will come later. Um, you know, it's kind of, you know, it's, uh, it, it has its pros and cons. The, the, the disadvantage, of course, this gets more and more imprecise, right? We might lose some railroads that are built around 1920. We lose the highway network. But on the other hand, the problem is that, of course, a lot of that might be, might be potentially endogenous, right? If the canal benefits some regions, maybe you want to connect these regions to the rest of the country, and this is where you will um, invest in infrastructure. So for this reason here, we kind of fix everything at the 1890 level, even though of course, that will lead to, to some measurement error. Now, how exactly does this market access calculation work? Um, we have, let's say the, the, the county C in the, in the United States, we have the domestic port um, and an international port. And now we would like to know what's the difference 
went from county C to um, this international port. So here um, we kind of use uh, an example that I think is actually not really in, in, in the data, but you know, it's just that's one that, that fits very well into the map. Because, you know, let's say we want to go from this county somewhere, I guess, in, in Alabama or, or Mississippi, and we want to go from there to, to Cuba. And let's say the closest port is New Orleans here. So what we do is we'd say, okay, what's the, what's the, what's the, the shortest distance going from this county in Alabama to New Orleans using the Donaldson Hornback uh, a matrix? And then we would add to that the sea base difference from the port, so New Orleans to Cuba, right? And then in, you know, in theory, now I use New Orleans. Now you could think that you know, there are obviously other routes. You could go from here to Miami and then over to Cuba, or you could go to maybe Mobile here and then over to Cuba. So we kind of do this for, for, all, the, for all possible ports, domestic ports, and then we see you know, what's kind of the shortest route from County C to every international port. And we do that once with the canal open and once with the canal closed. And then the next thing is um, that based on this, we, we use, uh, we, we construct market access, which for example here, international market access is defined as um, population weighted, uh, sorry, distance weighted population. So we basically sum up the populations of all the international destinations, but weight them by the distance um, that at how far they are from you, right? So if you're at, at the county, then obviously it's easier to trade with, you know, if you're at this county here in, in Alabama, it's obviously easier to trade with Cuba than it is with the United Kingdom. So, we, you know, we kind of add the, the to the Cuba's population and the UK's population, but we weight them, um, by the distance of the two destinations. And then another important uh, part is this uh, elasticity tau. That, you know, is kind of the, the distance elasticity of market access. Now into this, you know, we go several assumptions and parameters. Um, the first thing that we need to assume is, okay, well, I mean, we have this, we have kind of a, a cost matrix of how much it costs to, to go from, New York to Los Angeles within the United States, and we know the distance um, from New York to London over the sea, but we need to convert that into a cost. Um, so what we assume here is that going one kilometer over the open sea costs you around 0.1 cents. That's based on, on freight rates and actual trips in uh, Luigi Pascali's paper. And you know, if anything, this might be a, a bit more on the conservative, so a bit more expensive end. Still, um, this is much cheaper than, for example, railroad transportation. For example, Donaldson Hornbeck say that in 1890, it costs you around 60, uh, sorry, 0.63 cents to transport a ton over a mile on the US railroad. So as you can see, the open sea is, is still much cheaper at this point. Um, the other thing that we have is, is population. Um, and for this, we don't use raw population, we don't use the raw international population numbers, but instead we weight them by the 1900 GDP per capita relative to the United States. And the idea is that it's conditional on population, it's more beneficial for your trade if the other region is richer. So for example, um, the UK in 1900 has a GDP per capita that's about 10% higher than the US, so you so we weight the UK population by 1.1. And you know, with all this, we can do the international market access. And then we can do the same with domestic market access. Right? So we do what's the difference from every county to every other county with and without the canal? Because you know, some things might change because, for example, going from the west to the east coast um, becomes easier when you have the canal open. We don't weight the domestic county populations. Um, one reason is, you know, kind of the theoretical reason is if you think of an assumption of, of perfect mobility and hence utility equalization across counties, you know, that doesn't seem to be a very reasonable assumption for international markets back then, neither nowadays, but it seems quite reasonable for the US back then, or again, also nowadays. Secondly, the more empirical reason is we don't have data on GDP per capita for the counties. 
What we do later is kind of we try robustness check where we use occupational scores. So what kind of occupations do different counties have and how well paid are they? And, you know, we kind of use this to create weights. But in the baseline specification, we don't weight the domestic populations of the counties. Um, how do we define what's a domestic port? You know, why New Orleans, for example? Um, for this, basically, there's a document by um, one US department, I think it's one of Treasury, but I'm never fully sure, um, that lists kind of all official ports of entry in 1910. Um, so these were the ports where you could officially come in and, and, and um, deload, deload cargo. And then we basically take this list and match it to our coastal counties. And then we can say, okay, which of the coastal counties of the United States actually is a port county? The other thing is then this value tau. That's, as I said, it's the elasticity of market access with respect to effective distance. Um, in our baseline, we set this to equal minus one, right? The nice thing is if, it this, if this is minus one, we get a very easy um, to interpret um, formula, which is we, basically, we get people per dollar of trading cost, so to speak. Um, you know, minus one is also kind of the magical number that you very often find in empirical gravity papers, right? When you regress um, trade flows on the left-hand side on um, log distance, you know, typically you get something that is um, in the range of, um, of minus one. However, there are alternative, uh, alternative estimates and actually, you know, the parameter fluctuates quite a lot, minus four, minus eight, it can even go up to minus 12. We think that in our case, minus one makes a lot of intuitive sense because what our measure does is, you know, we have, we have small distances, the one to the neighboring county, and we have large distances, you know, from the US to China, for example. Now, if we have a very large elasticity, then that punishes the large distances very strongly relatively to the short ones. And then, it, you know, in the limit, the canal doesn't make a difference anymore because, you know, China is so far away if you have a, a large elasticity that it doesn't matter how many people live there, they, they, the, 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 the elasticity penalizes it that much that it doesn't add anything. Whereas the neighboring county, even though few people live there is close, so that makes a, a huge difference. So in, we think intuitively a small elasticity makes more sense in our case, but we'll show robustness um, with respect to different values. Okay, so based on all this, we can then we do, you know, this kind of calculation uh, for, mar for market access here, once for international ports and once for all U.S. counties. So we get um, a domestic market access and we get an international market access. And then um, we define the market access change, the total market access change as a ratio, which is the market access um, when there is a canal well, when the Panama Canal is open, divided by the market access when the canal is not open. Why do we do a ratio? Well, first of all, it gives us summary statistics that are very easy to interpret, right? That it gives us something like a percentage change. 1.05 would mean that this county gained 5% of market access. The other thing is it doesn't change with arbitrary unit changes in distance measurement, right? So we could use, because if you look at the, the distance term here, the DCP, you know, we, we could measure this in, in dollars or in, in, in cents. Um, this would cancel out if, if, we, if we do the ratio. And then the more pragmatic reason is, you know, later on, we will always take the log of this. And if we take the log of the ratio, it automatically creates um, differences in log market access due to the canal. Um, let me show you a couple of summary statistics. Um, this would be the market access um, without the canal. With the canal, you can see the overall market access change is around 2% for the average county. 0.4% um, is the domestic market access gain. 2.8% is the international market access gain. And as you can see from the population numbers, you know, all of this obviously happens at a time when the US population is growing very fast, right? So the uh, the average population of the population of the average count, county uh, more than doubles over the 60 years between 80, 80 
1940. How does it look um, in a map? So here we show deciles of market access change. Um, I think we can see, you know, some things that are relatively um, unsurprising. You know, it's the West Coast that benefits more. Um, that makes sense because, you know, we, for, we use everything at kind of 1880, 1893 level. So at this time, the West Coast is very sparsely populated. So, you know, if you think, what does the, what does the Panama Canal do? Well, it allows to go from the West Coast to the East Coast, from, West, from the West Coast to Europe, and it allows to go from the East Coast to the West Coast and from the East Coast to Asia. Now, from going from the East Coast to the West Coast in terms of population is not that interesting at this point because the West Coast is very sparsely populated. On the other hand, you know, going from the West to the East, that is obviously, uh, you know, that's, where the pop that's where you can reach more population. Similarly, um, also in terms of trade, obviously more trade happens between the, we the West Coast and Europe than it happens at this point between the East Coast uh, and Asia. You know, at the end, where does this variation come? You know, it's kind of a, an intersection between cross-sectional variation that is, that is due to, you know, how well connected are you to a port initially and how close is this port to the Panama Canal and on which side of the coast is it? What is the empirical specification? Conceptually, what we're running um, looks a bit like this. We regress log population of county C in the year T on the market act, the total market access of the same county, county fixed effects, year fixed effects, and then a couple of control variables at the county level um, that we allow to have time varying effects. Um, this market access will be given by the one without the canal before 1920 and the market access with the canal open in 1920 and afterwards. So the identifying variation, as you can see, comes only from changes in the market access due to the canal. And beta here can be, you know, it's a log log specification, so beta can be interpreted directly as an elasticity. Now, in practice, we run something that's maybe a bit simpler because, you know, we usually we only focus on two time periods. Then we can run everything in, in a first different specification, right? So, for example, we regress the log of population or the log difference in population between 1940 and 1900 on the market access change due to the canal, um, county, uh, uh, county characteristics, the county fixed effects are of course already implicit in the fact that we take the first difference here on both sides of the equation. Now, what are our, um, our, our county level controls? You know, one worry, obviously, given this is, you know, there may be broad geographic trends, right? Maybe there's a basic westward movement of U.S. population. Um, maybe there's a movement south or southward because of, of, of nicer climate. So we always control for longitude and latitude to capture kind of these broad geographic trends. We also control for the log population in 1880. Um, the idea is that, you know, this obviously goes into our market access calculation because it's the 1880 population of the other counties that are interesting, but also, you know, there might be agglomeration effects. So if you're highly populated in 1880, maybe you grow faster later on or slower for that matter. And we also always uh, include an indicator for being a coastal dummy, uh, sorry, a coastal county. It's a typo here. It's a dummy for being a coastal county. Um, again, if you look at the map, you can see that the change is obviously somewhat spatially clustered. So our standard errors will always be clustered on a large grid of five by five degrees. Let's start you know, with the simplest thing, a bivariate correlation where we have the change in log population between 1900 and 1940. And we regress that in, on the change in log market access due to the Panama Canal. Um, you can see there's a, there's a positive relationship. You know, obviously there's quite some uh, some dispersion, um, you know, there's, there's some counties that have very high population growth. Um, obviously, it doesn't work perfectly, but still, you know, there's a very clear positive relation. You know, you might, of course, be worried, you know, is it only driven by these kind of counties? But actually, also, if you, if you were to zoom in on this, um, on, the, on, the, on the counties with a smaller change in market access, we would still get uh, the same positive slope. 
Now let's you know let's actually run this in the regression with our control variables and everything. Um, what we do here is kind of the this is probably our, our most important estimate. This is the overall estimate between 1900. You know, 1900 is clearly prior to the canal. 1940 is after the canal. Um, we have around 2,400 counties, around a bit less than 50 of these five by five uh, degree grid cells that we cluster on. And as you can see, what we get here is an elasticity of around 4.5. What we can also do is, you know, we can decompose this into, um, or we can do the same regression for different time periods. Column two shows 1880 to 1900. That's very interesting because that's kind of a placebo check in a sense, right? So here, you know, in some sense, what we're doing is a little bit like a difference in differences specification. Um, so what we want to see is something like parallel trends before the canal opens. So what we see is before the canal opens, we don't see a significant effect of the future market access change on population growth. So that's obviously very reassuring. 1920, no, sorry, 1920 is kind of a, a weird year, right? In the sense, the canal is open for six years, but there have been these problems. Uh, we could see that there is some traffic, but you know, it's probably not unreasonable to expect that we don't see the full effect by 1920. And we also see this in the data, the elasticity here <clears throat> is only 1.8, 1.9. And then if we go from 1920 to 1940, um, there's another additional effect um, with an elasticity of 2.6. So what we kind of see is there's no effect before the canal opens, a first effect immediately afterwards, and then an, an additional effect um, until 1940. In the paper, we also show the results going in 20 year intervals until the year 2000. The problem is just that, you know, our measure of market access change using the 1890 distance matrix obviously gets more and more imprecise. Um, so, you know, that's something you, you need to take this with a, a quite large grain of salt. So I don't want to um, overstress these results. Um, our elasticity um, is quite large, 4.5. Um, Donaldson and Hornbeck using the railroads in the US find 0 0.5 for land values. Um, FIRA on, in, a, in a kind of cross country paper that uses uh, the Suez Canal finds a, a trade income elasticity of around 0.25. Um, though at the same time, I think our effect is also a bit more medium to long run in the sense we have a longer time period for it to materialize. Okay, so these would be our, our basic results. Um, positive effect of market access on, on population growth. Now we have a couple of, of follow-up questions, so to speak. Um, the first thing is, in, you know, there's a, a recent paper by, by Baum Snowett co-authors that look at the expansion of the, the, road, rail, uh, the road network um, in China. And they find that actually not every city in China benefited from the road network, but that actually it was mostly the large cities um, or the more important cities that, that benefited from being better connected and the other ones actually lost a bit out. So one question that we're going to ask is also here, does the effect vary by the initial, not in our case, not city size, but by the initial county size? Other question is, you know, how are different industries affected? Relatedly, you know, what happens to factor prices? What happens to immigration? And then obviously finally, as for any empirical paper, you know, how robust are these effects? First question um, that I'll be relatively brief because, you know, I think there's not so much to see here is how about the heterogeneity by initial population? So here we look at the market access coefficient depending on whether the, the county is in, in which initial population decile the county is. And you can see, I mean, there's obviously some, some fluctuation, but you know, it's a, I would say by and at large, um, to me, it looks pretty flat. So we don't seem to have the same um, result as, as Bomb Snow and co-authors that, you know, it's not that only the large cities um, benefit. If anything, it seems to be that it's more the kind of medium ones that, that are gaining the most. How about heterogeneity by sector? Um, as I said, in, in the data set that we use, we have three different sectors. Um, 
we have services, we have manufacturing, and we have agriculture. So here we again do kind of the, the check for in the pre-period, the initial period, and then 1920 to 1940. Again, there's not much going on, luckily, and there's only, this one is somewhat significant, but if anything goes in the opposite direction, um, not much going on before the canal opens. Then, you know, service sectors grow initially. Manufacturing initially grows very fast. Um, and then in the next 20 years, 1920 to 1940, it kind of reverses a bit with the services growing a bit faster than the manufacturing, whereas agriculture actually never seems to be um, affected very much. Now, why, you know, why should the non-tradable you know, let, let's call services the non-tradable goods, right? I mean, that's something that usually is, is uh, consumed locally. So why should they benefit from the Panama Canal? It's not that you will go um, to get a haircut from, from Los Angeles to New York, of course. Um, but I think this chimes in very nicely with the literature on local multipliers. If you look at papers by, by Van Dyck or by Moretti, you find that you know, usually if you add one additional tradable jobs, you know, as here we add jobs in the manufacturing sector, um, usually you also add jobs in the service sector or in the, in the non-tradable um, sector. And that's also something that we find here. And then there's also a kind of a theoretical tradition where you nest a tradable and non-tradable CES in a cop Nautilus. A um, couple of model examples here. So, you know, our results kind of might give some more empirical justification for that as well. Um, factor prices, how do they um, react? So one thing that we can look at is manufacturing wage growth. Here, for simplicity, we only look at 1900 to 1940. Not surprisingly, um, it also grows. So this is also an elasticity. If your market access goes up by 1%, then also your manufacturing wages go up by 1%. Uh, for land value, the effect is even stronger. Um, and finally, you know, one thing that we can't look as well as we would like to is immigration. Um, because if, if you work, if maybe you've, you've worked with someone with the US Census, then you know that um, for a long time, the U.S. Census didn't ask about migration within the U.S. So obviously, you, you know where someone is born. And, you know, if someone is born in, in Germany, then obviously this person is an immigrant in the U.S. But if someone lives in New York and, and is born in the U.S., we typically don't know whether they're an immigrant to New York or not. Well, the one thing that we know is the state of birth. So what we can look at is the share of people in the county that live in a state that is not their state of birth. And we call these immigrants now for this, you know, to, as a shorthand. They're not all the immigrants because obviously, you know, you can move from Houston to Austin in Texas and then you wouldn't show up. But we would capture all the people that move from Oklahoma to Texas, for example. And again, uh, we find here uh, a strong positive effect as well. Okay, now, let me go a bit into the robustness checks. You know, I, I gave you the list of kind of all the things that we need to assume or, you know, take a stand on initially. You know, things like what is theta? Should we weight domestic population? Should we weight international population? How exactly should the cost distances be calculated? Um, and then also obviously the choice of, of what control variables to enter. Let me start with the one that's probably the most controversial among trade economists, because you know, there's such a range of, of parameter values for this theta. Again, you know, our baseline is 4.4. Um, we can, tr with the theta of minus one, we can set a value of minus four, we can set a value of minus eight. You can see that the point estimates change a bit, but the overall qualitative con uh, conclusion um, is actually always the same and, you know, usually the, the confidence intervals here will never exclude the, the 4.49. So um, it seems, you know, that, you, you know, to me, it's not clear which value of theta is the best. Um, in my opinion, was, something speaks for minus one in our case, but, you know, it also doesn't seem to matter that much, at least for the qualitative results. Um, again, in the baseline, we weight the international populations in the market access calculation by their relative GDP. We do not weight domestic populations. Um, again, you might not be happy with this. Here, you know, we can 
not weight the international population. So this is kind of one man, one or one person, one unit in the market access calculation. Um, this doesn't matter at all, I would say. We can also weight the domestic population by kind of a measure of how well paid are the occupations. So, you know, obviously in New York, you will have a lot of lawyers, etc. They are higher paid than farmers in Kansas. So New York would get a higher um, weight than a county in Kansas. But again, this also doesn't seem to matter. Um, cost distances, we can also, you know, play a bit around with this. Again, here I repeat the baseline specification. Then you know, there are some things that we haven't included in our calculation. Um, for example, there could be a transshipment cost, right? If you go from New York to the Panama, or let's say you go from um, St. Louis to New York, well, that was probably a bad example. So let's say you go from, from West, a county in West Virginia to New York and then via the Panama Canal to, to Shanghai, let's say. Then you know you will travel, let's say, via railroad from West Virginia to New York. Then you need to load the good onto the, the ship and then go through the canal. So one thing that we haven't added, but that we add here is a transshipment cost whenever you go on an ocean ship. Okay, whenever you load the good to the port, we add, I think, a, a 50 cent penalty for that. The other thing is that it was costly to use the Panama Canal. You had to pay around 90 cents for every ton of cargo. So here we also add 90 cents for every route that goes through the Panama Canal. And finally, of course, you know, one problem with the international destinations is that we're talking of a time, uh, kind of a pre-WTO time, so tariffs are quite widespread. Tariffs are also very difficult for us to address because if you look at the US tax code back then, uh, tariff code back then, um, it, the, first of all, it's usually ad valorem, not on the weight. So you will pay some, you know, some percent for every $100 of a good. Secondly, it varies a lot by the good. Some goods have very low tariffs, some others not. So it's actually quite difficult to think of the average tariff per ton. So what we did here is we just looked at some goods that are taxed on a per ton basis. And then we took one value, I think one of the higher ones was $5. So here we add a $5 tariff to every route that goes to an international destination with or without the canal of course as you can, <coughs> excuse me as you can see if anything this uh, makes result uh, the results a bit um, a bit stronger even um, we have measured the cost distance in dollars so how much does it cost you to get one ton from place a to place b we could also do it in kilometers you know again kind of use making a, including a penalty or an a cost advantage for C that a kilometer over C is not the same as a kilometer over land. And at this point, we could also just say, you know, let's just do geometric distances. So let's not use railroads and canals and least cost paths. Let's just do straight lines from the US. Um, that obviously makes the thing a bit less precise. So, you know, it makes sense that actually we get something that's, uh, that's more attenuated and towards zero. Finally, how about geographic confounders? Um, as I said, we always um, control for longitude, latitude being on the coast. Um, you know, you might of course think of other things. Let me start with something that doesn't work very well. Um, that's including state fixed effects. So if we include state fixed effects, you can see standard error goes up a bit and the, um, the point estimate goes down quite a bit. The big problem that we have here, we think, is that the variation that we live off, if you remember the map, is you know, somewhat coarse, right? So there's a lot of variation across states. Within state, there's just not that much variation. For example, if we were to regress the market axis change on the state fixed effects, the R squared of this is something along 80%. So if we include the state fixed effects, unfortunately, most of our identifying variation is gone. So I think that's why this doesn't work. It's, a little bit, you know, kind of throwing out the baby with the bathwater. So, you know, in, instead of thinking, okay, at the same time, you know, the state fixed effects are a bit like black box, right? So what we, th what we do instead is let's say, okay, let's try to control for some specific confounders. You know, what could vary across geography and could be a problem? 
One thing could be soil quality, right? Maybe some regions in the south, they are very useful for cotton. They also benefit more from the canal. Maybe that's a confounder. Doesn't seem to be the case. Maybe it's the initial industry distribution, right? Maybe more agricultural regions are in the Midwest. The Midwest doesn't benefit, but the manufacturing regions do benefit, and hence this explains our results. So it can control for the initial shares of manufacturing or services, also doesn't seem to matter. Is it just a reallocation of the US population to the coast? Well, we can control, we always control for being a coastal county. We can also control for coastal states. Again, standard errors go up, point estimate a bit down, but we still find a quite large positive effect here. And the other thing that we could also do is, you know, maybe it's just part of, you know, if, if you look at the map, obviously the, the, the most obvious concern, if you look at this map as well, is what we're seeing here in this positive result, is it just the rise of California and the rise of, of Washington, of, of Seattle, of San, Francisco, of San Francisco, of Los Angeles. So another thing that we can do is we can control for the states down the West Coast, Washington, Oregon, California. And again, it, that doesn't seem to be the case. We still um, get a very similar effect here as in our baseline of around 4.4. Uh, okay. Now, one final thing um, that I'll, I'll be relatively brief, brief about is um, welfare. You know, one thing that we can also think about is what are the welfare co uh, consequences um, of this? Very famous, or probably the, at the moment, probably the, the most important model to quantify welfare effects of trade is the model by Akulakis and co authors, 2012. The problem with this model is it thinks of you know, countries, like a country goes from autarky to free trade. Um, Steve Redding, luckily for us, has a, written a paper in 2016 that kind of extend this model to subnational units, which we have, which is the county. And he shows that if you go from autarky to world trade, um, you have this basic welfare gain which as you can see, depends on a lot of things. It depends on the domestic trade share. So in our case, domestic here means the within county trade share. So how much of the income of county X is spent within county X? Um, then it depends on the population of the counties. It depends on the share of consumption that is spent on land. The elasticity of trade flows with respect to trade costs and the elasticity of population with respect to real income. Um, we basically follow Steve Redding and you know, set our parameters according to his, which is you know, alpha 0.75, this elasticity three, this elasticity four. And then you know, where does our, our thing come in? Well, we say what we have here is the, the population with autarky. In our case, think of autarky as being pre-canal and this is the population with the canal. So what we do is we predict the counterfactual population in 1940, which is basically the 1900 population, plus the growth that is only due to the market access. Okay, so we abstract from you know, everything else, just if only market access had changed between 1900 and 1940, what will be the counterfactual 1940 population? And then one problem that we, one final thing is that in, the, in this Reading model, there's no international migration. So we normalize everything. So it sums to, that the, the counterfactual 1940 population sums to 1900 levels to also abstract from, you know, the inflow of international migrants. We don't know what the county level domestic trade share is, honestly. Um, so here, you know, we just experiment with saying, what if it's 80%, what if it's 60%, what if it's 40%? And based on this, you know, we get resulting welfare gains that are in the ballpark of around 0 0.1 to 0.2%. And that's actually very close to existing estimates of the welfare consequence of the Panama Canal based on, on other identification, other empirical strategies. Ironically, you know, if, if you do a little bit of, you know, back of the envelope, you know, 
with a lot of grains of salt analysis, the US paid around 0.88% of US GDP. So, you know, even if we take the most optimistic estimate of 0.21, um, this would mean that the canal, at least by 1940, doesn't seem to have passed the cost benefit test. Um, but, you know, again, this is something, you know, I think it's a nice intellectual exercise, but, you know, it, it comes with a, lot of, with a lot of caveats, and I really don't want to overemphasize this. You know, first of all, we fix everything at 1900 levels, right? So in our, or 1880 levels, in our market access calculation, we use international populations in 1900, we use US populations in 1880. The canal obviously becomes more valuable if populations grow because then you can reach more people, right? Reaching Los Angeles is not that important for New York in, in 1900 because Los Angeles is very thinly populated. But reaching Los Angeles nowadays um, is extremely important. And the same goes you know, with a lot of countries that have had tremendous uh, population growth. So you know, that's something that obviously we don't have in this cost benefit calculation that would add to the costs. The other problem is that the model that we base the, the calculation on abstracts from immigration into the United States. And then finally, it's also not that clear, you know, how to factor in deaths during the construction um, or things like time discounting, which might also change the calculus. Um, at this point, uh, let me conclude. So we find that the Panama Canal had a long lasting and very stark effect on population location in the United States. We find a very large long run elasticity of population with respect to market access. Um, the effect seems to be fairly similar for tradable industries, you know, here kind of, again, in the shorthand of tradable being manufacturing and non-tradable being services. But among these two, the effect seems to be similar. Um, and from the last thing, you know, I think the crucial thing is the cost benefit test here is very hard to calculate. Um, if you believe everything that we've done, and if you want to take it at face value, it will mean that by 1940, at least the canal has not passed um, the cost benefit test. But again, you know, um, there are a lot of caveats here. Okay, um, that will be it um, from my side. Um, so I think now we have some discussion. Chi Cheng, are you taking over again? Yeah. I will moderate the discussion and the Q&A from our audience. So thank you very much, Stephen, uh, for the very uh, wonderful talk. Uh, well, today, uh, actually, we have a, a discussion, uh, Professor Sun Chang, our colleague from Hong Kong University Business School. Uh, Professor Sun is also working on trade and economic geography. So. Uh, he will spend uh, 10 or more time to, to give some brief comments and discussion on your talk before we turn to the Q&A from the audience. Yeah, perfect. Hey, Chang. Hi, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Stefan, for uh, such a great uh, presentation. Uh, it's a really uh, uh, fantastic paper. Um, so, I, so this is uh, clearly not a very organized uh, discussion, uh, so it's not very formal. I'm just going to kind of throw out some of the, the, the questions uh, uh, which I have when I uh, was uh, listening to the presentation. Um, so I, I kind of want to start from the last bit where you do this cost-benefit analysis, which I think is great. Uh, very few papers that try to do this uh, uh, in a very serious way. Um, so the US investment is one time, right? Mm. And how do I think the, about the welfare gain? Is it is it per year or if you think if this is per year, then this could be huge, right? So yeah. you know, compared to a one-time uh, investment. So um, the way I understood the model, it's like it's a bit the problem in the whole in the whole model, and it's something that I also still struggle a bit with. Like the model, basically, it, it, it's kind of the gains by nineteen forty. So the ones that are apparent in the changes of um, domestic trade shares and um, population by 1940. Um, but at the same time, you know, it, it's really, the, there's this issue, of course, that, you know, the canal kind of generates benefits every year, so to speak, right? 
Um, and that's something that I'm also not, not fully sure how, exa how exactly to, to address. So like the way I understood the welfare calculation in, in, in the Reading model is, you know, it's kind of, it takes the, it, all, of the all is reflected in changes in the domestic trade share and the, and the, um, the, the population, which, you know, we can, we try to back out through the market access changes. Um, but in that sense, you know, that's also a bit of the problem in the sense that, you know, these, the benefits of the canal in these, both in these terms in market access and population will continue to grow. And we can't really do that in our analysis. So I think that's, uh, that's a bit the problem. So I think I, I see it as per 1940 aggregate, but they would go up in the future. And that's something that we can't really quantify, I would say. And, and probably already by 1940, we underestimate because we're not like the, the market access is based on the 1900 population and not the 1940 population. So already by 1940, the canal is more valuable than it was in, in, 19, in 1900. So in that sense, it's kind of a, a lower bound, which is a bit unfortunate given that it doesn't pass the test. Um, but yeah. Just a uh, follow up on this uh, discussion, uh, how to measure the, the benefit in the long term. Have you ever tried to look at this uh, over 1940? Um, yeah, we have. It's something we have in, in the paper appendix. So we find actually quite a, the, the effect seems to continue um, well into 2000, I think. And the effect, of the, so if you do 1900 to 2000, the elasticity is even larger than for 1900 to 1940. Um, so there are several years where, besides, I think between 40 and 60 and also later on, um, you find some growth. And the problem is, you know, they're a bit harder to interpret, obviously, these estimates, sure, because sure, sure, sure. all of the things that happen in between. Uh, yeah. But yeah, but I, I think, I mean, it's, it's interesting to see these because uh, even if suppose, I think the, the worry is that maybe there are, for example, there are follow up infrastructure investments, uh, exactly. uh, just in response to this uh, opening of the canal. Um, but if you think all these things, they're induced by this first reduction in trade costs. Yeah. Um, due to the canal, then you kind of can think these are the overall impact of the of the canal. So this kind of gives you like a upper bound of yeah. the, the the welfare effect uh, or uh, yeah of 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 this uh, infrastructure. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, so my poll, I mean the other uh, my other comments. I think I have a kind of a small question on identification. I'm not a identification person, so I, I don't have a lot of comments on these things. Uh, but then I uh, have more questions related to how to connect the model to, uh, how to connect the data to the model, uh, because I'm, I do uh, structural work uh, and I'm more familiar with these things. Uh, so I guess for, uh, for identification, the only thing I kind of worry is, uh, because you show this, this, this photo, uh, you, you show this variation on the, on, the, on the map, right? It seems that there is a kind of a gradual uh, uh, change uh, in this reduction in uh, market access. Uh, so one thing that kind of really worries me is whether there are anything that has uh, such a feat, any other change, maybe it's related to technology, uh, maybe it's, uh, uh, for example, you think about maritime uh, shipping and technology mm -hmm. improvement there, that can benefit the coastal areas more than the inland. Um, so is there a way for example, to, to kind of um, control for those things, or maybe just document there is not such technology breakthrough during this period. I think that can also help us to understand identification. Yeah, no, that, that, I mean, I, I fully agree. I think this is kind of the, the big worry that, that also I have a bit with, you know, like with believing the results. Like I, I do believe them, but you know, it, it's kind of obvious you look at the map and say, okay, things could go wrong here. And then, you know, at the, the it's kind of, you know, we, what we're trying to do at the moment in robust check is a bit, okay, you know, what could be the problem? And then say, okay, I mean, one thing is the, that, that we always control for being on the coast. So, you know, if there's something that benefits all the coastal port counties, then that's already taken out in our analysis. Um, that, that, that's kind of the, the good thing. Then, you know, we think of, you know, what could be other things? Is it that along the coast, they have better soil or worse soil and you know we're moving out of agriculture so places that initially have good soil are disadvantaged so that also doesn't seem to be and then we, we, we try to we basically we, we try to go a bit you know what what could be possible confounders um you know if, if you have any other idea i'm happy to try whether there's something else 
uh, technological improvements, I think the good thing there is that's also one, uh, I would say, advantage of kind of finishing in 1940 is that later on you have this wave of containerization. Right, that they are now, that's also something that's now, you know, David Naji and, and co authors um, study that a lot, and, and also other people that, you know, has changed the trading patterns a lot, has changed the port setups a lot, has changed kind of the requirements for a port. You know, a lot of places can't really have a modern port anymore because you can't have these deep channels that you need. The good thing is, I think that that came more in the 50s, 60s. So that's, I think, one advantage of kind of finishing in the 40s is that we kind of can abstract from that. Um, but, you yeah, know, I mean, that's something that, you know, it's something that, you know, I don't think we have kind of the silver bullet here that, you know, kills all the, the, the concerns. Obviously, you know, there is a geographic component to, you know, the canal is in one place and places close to it will benefit more. So at the moment, we kind of try to directly tackle what could be confound us. Now I see why you kind of want to stop at 1940, right? So that's a kind of another reason to avoid the yeah. confounding uh, technology improvement yeah. uh, in shipping. Yeah, yeah thanks. Um, so my other comments, they're kind of relatively small, but I think it's connected to uh, the structural part uh, of the paper. Uh, I think the, my first comment is, so you have a slide talking about the trade elasticity. Uh, yeah. And you're using negative one uh, in the main specification. Yeah. Uh, Maybe I missed it. So, are you using distance or are you using the cost of sh of transportation when you're constructing these deeds? Yeah, so that's also something that I actually I'm still sometimes a bit confused in the trade literature myself. So uh, maybe you can help me. Actually, um, we're using something which I think Steve Redding in one of his papers calls it effective distance. So it, it's not the full trade costs, but it's like distance that takes into account different modes of transportation with with so the distance is measured in kilometer in, in dollars so it kind of as a cost but it's not the full trade costs it's just the costs of crossing distance are different you know going over a mountain or going over the sea um so in that sense uh, it's kind of the elasticity with respect to effective distance okay no, so, uh, so I'm not that familiar with this, this concept, but my only comment is that if you're using a cost, for example, if you calculate the transportation cost or tariff, right? Whether yeah. if, as long as this is a, this is a, um, uh, this is a dollar uh, cost, uh, the, the, usually we use uh, larger elasticities like negative mm -hmm. four or negative eight in Eaton Cotton. The yep. negative one elasticity that you cited in the literature, they are just looking at distance. Yep. Uh, so there is another thing, which is the elasticity of the trade cost with respect to distance, right? So you need yep. to multiply that to, to obtain this uh, negative one thing. Um, yep. So I, I, as long as you are making these two consistent, right, you can either follow yep. the, 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 the gravity literature uh, by using distance and negative one, or you can use a cost-based uh, uh, distance, and then you say, uh, you follow the Eaton Cotton or other trade papers to use a larger elasticity. Yeah. I think as long as they are consistent, uh, I think it's good. Yeah, okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, and um, let me see what questions I have here. Um, yeah, I guess my final question is kind of, it's maybe it's beyond the scope of this paper, but I kind of want to, uh, kind of have a better interpretation of the reduced form uh, coefficients because you, you kind of do have a model, right? A baseline model. Or if you go back to uh, the paper by uh, Dave Donaldson and Hornbeck, uh, they have a struck model in the paper. And I guess uh, the uh, empirical specification, you, you do follow their empirical specification, but in that um, model, uh, in their paper, actually, uh, all the reduced form parameters had a structural interpretation. So they are combinations yeah. of the structural parameters. I'm just wondering whether you can actually kind of connect your reduced form uh, estimates with those structural parameters and then base your uh, counterfactual uh, on those structural parameters. A nice thing about what you are doing, for example, when I look at the counterfactual on welfare, is you just um, let the, the reduced form to predict the, 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 the population change. And then you use a structural model, you're feeding those population change into the structural model and get the welfare change. I think yeah. that's 
kind of innovative. Actually, I haven't seen a lot of work uh, doing exactly that. Um, but I'm also interested in how it is different from a traditional way, the traditional way that people do uh, counterfactuals, mm -hmm. which is having the, the structural parameters and, and, and feeding into the data, uh, feeding into the model and let the model speak out uh, this number yep. of welfare change. So I think that yep. contrast would be uh, quite interesting for me too. Yeah, no, it's an, that's a very interesting idea. I haven't thought about that. Um, how, how, what our parameters tell us about structural parameters. That's something that's yeah. actually very interesting. Yeah, because yeah, as you said, we basically kind of in the, in the background of what we do is basically the Donaldson Hornbeck model, right? They right, right. It's the same way of calculating the market axis. So that's something we, we could look into, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, one thing that surprised me is uh, how big the numbers are, right? So you are getting an elasticity of like six uh, for land values, but Donuts and Hornback has 0.5. So that difference might tell us about um, how maybe the underlying D parameters are actually different or uh, just, yeah. just um, kind of try to extract more from these reduced form uh, elasticities. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Sorry, I'm just writing things down. <laughs> just, uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's very that's that's a very interesting point. Yeah. That's pretty much all my questions. And okay. um, thank you very I will, much. I will leave the time uh, to you guys. That was very helpful. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you, Chang. So, Stephen, uh, do you have more uh, response to Chang's question or? We proceed to to the to the question from audience now. I think we can proceed to the questions from the audience. Yeah. Okay. Uh, actually, before that, I want to ask. Uh, as far as I know, in the in the late uh, late nineteenth to early twentieth century, uh, United States also experienced the the expansion of other important communication and modern transportations like the telegraph, like the railway system. Mm. So I'm just wondering why, uh, what's the relative importance of the, of the opening of the uh, Panama Canal to this domestic uh, modernization of the transportation in shaping the, the, the market access and the economic geography. So, yeah. so what's your view on this? That's a, it's a very good, but very tricky question. <laughs> um, I mean, especially the problem with the railroad is, you, you know, you have this kind of very gradual, gradual expanse, right? If, if you, it starts kind of in the Northeast and then it kind of spreads throughout the whole country by 1865, I think the East and the West are linked. Um, so I, I, from top of my head, I, I don't know how, you know, how to think about the, the relative um, the relative contribution of the two things. Like, I guess one thing that's a bit different is that, you know, the railroad is kind of agnostic, shall we say, in the sense you can build a railroad nearly anywhere, whereas the canal obviously has a very clear, you know, the canal clearly contributes to coastal population, right? These are the regions that benefit more, whereas the railroad is probably something that um, is, you know, can help anybody anywhere if you, if you just build one um, and the same will have would be true later on for the highway right in in the 40s 50s they start to build the interstate highway network uh, which has the same thing um, so I guess maybe in some sense it, you know a, on the one hand they could complement each other right in the sense that once you have agglomerations that's where you invest that's where you build railroads and highways but on the other hand it's, it's true that probably my first guess would be that the railroads and the highways are probably more help to disperse a bit into the, the inner side of the country. Whereas the canal probably more gets you back to the coast a bit, I would say. I think these are probably a bit the, the forces at play, but it's a, it's a little bit of conjecture because I, I don't know the literature on the railroads that well. Um, but I think that would be a bit, a bit my, uh, my intuition here. Okay, thank you. So now let's turn to the audience question. Uh, the first one is related to your, to your research, but in a different context. The question is, uh, literally, Thailand government writes the proposal again to build 
a canal between Changfeng and uh, Ranen. What do, do you think on the economic effect of this canal, especially on Singapore, who benefits a lot from the freight we are straight of Malanka. <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, so, so policy question. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's something that I am always a bit hesitant in the sense, you know, um, like the honest answer is I don't really feel qualified to answer that in the sense that this is a very historical analysis, um, which, you know, I, I, I like these paper. I like, I like my paper, of course, and I like my paper because, I, but I think of it more as a, you know, is it explains us a bit why we are where we are nowadays a bit, you know, in the terms of geography of the United States. Um, and, but, you know, I wouldn't take this now to a Senate hearing in the United States and tell them this is how much you should invest into the Panama Canal. And for the same reason, uh, I also wouldn't pass judgment on, uh, on, an, on another infrastructure project uh, like that. What I do know is that, you know, one thing that, you know, it's, it's not our paper, but I know there's a research team that does, has an ongoing project on the Panama Canal and trade diversion. The idea being that, you know, of course, we, we think of the great things of the, of the, of the Panama Canal, right? That it, it connects things. But now, you know, think that you are a place like Argentina or, or Chile on the other side of the coast. You know, before the canal, all the ships, you know, had to go along the coast and maybe they stopped in Montevideo or they stopped in Buenos Aires. They stopped in, in, in along the coast of Chile, maybe to refuel or to do things. And now they don't come anymore, right? So the, that's something that is not in our paper, but you know something that, that still people look into for the Panama Canal, which is trade diversion. That you know, we, here in our paper, we kind of look at the winners, which are the Americans, um, because you know they get the shorter route from the east to the west. But there might also be losers um, because they get ignored, so to speak, in, in the future. And and you know that's something that. Um, I guess like a lot of um, infrastructure projects have, um, potentially also the, the one in, in Thailand, but again, it's something that I, I can't really speak to, I'm afraid. Though I agree that it's a very interesting, very interesting question. But I feel as, as kind of a more economic historian, I would be overstepping, um, overstepping my, my boundaries here a bit. Okay, thank you. The next question is, uh, I believe the welfare gains you compute are per year welfare, welfare gains. So they could or should be compared to the annual cost of financing the canal, 0.88 PC of GDP, finance and 5% is a cost of 0.045 PC of GDP per year, making mm. the canal a good investment. Can, okay, you, yeah. can you please come back on that issue and explain why I'm wrong or not? Yeah, yeah so again, I'm, I'm also not yet fully sure. So that's something where the, the basic problem is that, you know, if you look at the structural model, the structural model only has kind of two, wait, let me maybe quickly share my screen just to um, make clear what, uh, uh, where I am. So if you look, if you look at the formula here, right, the, in some sense, the, 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 the structural model only has two time periods, one, one post and one pre, and one pre, right? And then, so we have, let's say this is 1940, this is 1900. And so this is the population in 1900, this is the population in 1940, the, the domestic trade shares in 1900, 1940. Um, so the way I interpret the model is this is kind of, you know, the, the, the change between going from A to T, from auto key to trade, which in, in my example would be from canal open, uh, sorry, from canal closed to canal open. So that's why I think of this as a one of, um, as a one of change. Um, but I, you know, I agree that it's also something that um, I'm sorry, um, I'm also not yet, um, um, 100% sure, but to me, it's kind of going from one steady state to the other steady state. And in our case, we just take one 1940 and 1900 as these two steady states. So the cost is, um, is kind of the, 
um, the the total cost and hence the um, the the total um, uh, welfare gain. It's true that you know obviously you enjoy this advantage every year, um, but kind of you don't advantage enjoy it every year in the 1940 level, so to speak. But it's something that um, I need. I, I think I, I need to have another more detailed look at the at the at the Reading paper to to see how exactly um, the setup is there. But yeah, it's, it's a very good question. Um, it's something that again I'm also not fully sure. It's, it's always you know, it, it's quite easy to write that into a structural model, but then once you take it to the data, uh, it's always. Um, it's always a bit more. It's always been tricky to think of this, especially when you have this this stylized thing of only two time periods. Okay. Well, uh, the third question is about the, the the regression. We know that large populations could furnish market development. So, in this regression, how to exclude the possibility that the regre regression coefficient it's a causal inference of the population's effect to market development. Again, yeah, no, that, that, that's, a, that's a very, very important point, obviously, because you know, if, if you think of our regression, if you think of domestic, what's the measure of market access, it contains the neighboring counties' populations. And so, you know, it's kind of always correlated with population levels already. And obviously then we look at population. Um, the way we try to address this here is we all, all our regressions control for the log 1880 population. So if there's an effect of, you know, kind of initial period um, population on the subsequent growth, we control for that using this initial share. You know, of course, you could think of also controlling for, you know, the 1920 population. But then, you know, that might again be an outcome of the Panama Canal. So we, we kind of get into a bad control problem. So our idea here is to, to keep everything, to, to use the, the initial population, 1880, and to control for that. So if there's kind of an, an agglomeration that the initially populated place also attracts more people, um, that's something that we have already controlled for. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Uh, thank you, Chang. Uh, for time reason, we can we cannot cover all the questions from the audience. So, so uh, now thank you, thanks a lot to all the questions already from my side. Thank <laughs> you very much. Okay, now uh, let's leave several minutes to our webinar organizer, Professor Zhu Chen, uh, for concluding remark. And uh, meanwhile, he will announce the next two uh, web webinar. Professor Chen. Uh, thank you, Zhu uh, Chen, uh, and. Uh, also, uh, thanks go to uh, Stephen. Actually, I, I have a, 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 a two like very quick uh, questions, or so just for stimulating additional thought. I, we know that you have focused on the uh, U.S. Um, uh, uh, districts uh, in terms of the impact uh, of the uh, canal on their population growth and uh, economic growth and so on. So why don't you look, why don't you look at some of the uh, more nearby countries uh, that could potentially have benefited much more directly like uh, the Dominican Republic, Cuba, mm -hmm. Mexico and so on because the, U the US states and uh, districts are much further away um, uh, but uh, I, I know the, the, um, the other factors related to institutions and policies and so on um, have a big uh, bearing on this uh, in the sense that the, the, the U.S. Uh, is much more um, full growth and pro growth and so on than the Dominican Republic. Uh, but uh, if that's the case, I wonder whether you should, you would want to consider some interactive terms, I guess it would be a little bit hard to do huh? because, you know, the Dominican Republic is much, much closer uh, to the Panama Canal. And uh, I don't know whether anyone has examined 
the impact uh, of the canal on these mm. more nearby countries. Um, anyway, so what you know, I mean, I, I agree. Uh, and you know, like I, I always make the joke that, you know, it seems in economics, when you do empirical work, very often either you work on your home country or you work on the US. Because, you know, one thing is always that the data that they have is obviously also, you know, it's, it's very easily accessible and it has, thanks to the census, they have a very good data infrastructure. So, you know, one problem that, you know, I just don't know how the data is in the Dominican Republic and in Mexico. What I can tell you is so, there have been some cross-country analyses of the impact of the canal. Um, this is a paper by Hugo and Umana Dajut. Um, and they do a bit, you know, kind of a more cross-country analysis of the canals. Uh, so I don't know whether they look at an interaction of, you know, which regions and countries benefit more, but they do have these kind of, I think actually they have some benefits per country. So at the, at the macro level, I think that that has been done by, by these two authors. Mm. Yeah. Now, if we want to go within country, then it becomes a data question. And then I, I just don't know what the data would look like in, in Mexico, for example. Mm. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. And thank also, you. thank you, uh, John, uh, for uh, giving your thoughts on, on, and comments on the paper. Uh, but for uh, the next two weeks, we're going to move back to um, uh, Thursday, our Thursday schedule again. Uh, more specifically, a week uh, from this coming Thursday, uh, that is uh, October 8th, uh, we will have um, Murat uh, Iyengam uh, from the University of Colorado Boulder. Uh, he's going to speak on a theory of cultural revivals. Uh, remember, that will be on October 8th uh, at 9 o'clock Hong Kong time. Uh, in the morning, okay? And then actually after um, uh, Mura Ilgun, uh, two weeks from this Thursday, we will have Omar Ozak uh, from um, uh, the, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, here, here, is, here are the details. So he's with uh, the Southern Methodist University in Texas. Uh, he will speak on borderline disorder de facto historical ethnic borders and contemporary conflict in Africa. So his talk will also be at 9 a.m. Uh, Hong Kong time on Thursday, uh, but on uh, October 15th. Uh, so you're all welcome to sign up and then join us uh, in the following two weeks. So again, thank you everyone uh, for making today's webinar possible. Uh, thank you, uh, Chu Chen. See you next thank time. Thank you, on my side. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.